Well, today we are going to start looking at some questions. We have three questions that we're going to look at in the next three weeks. And these are three, what I call the three most important questions that every Christian should know. Well, that's pretty, that's placing some very pretty high ex expectations on these questions. And I suppose it could be argued that there are other questions as well that we should know the answers to. And I would say, yeah, probably. But these three are really core. They, they're the most foundational questions that we can think of, especially as we're looking at the possibility if you came across somebody who wanted to know why do you go to church or why should I go to church. And so these three questions are why do I need Jesus, why do I need the church, and why do I need this particular church. And I believe that there are about 17 churches within our city limits. So you go around the region, around our city, and there's even more churches. Churches dot the landscape of America. Some are different than others. Some seem relatively similar. And so we ask, why this particular church? And if anybody is thinking about that, it's good to have something that you can say. And because people who are thinking about church, they're, they're asking that question, even if it's not out loud. In our, our, in our current day, many people are wondering, why? Why should I go? Why should I give up the time? It doesn't seem relevant for some people. It doesn't seem relevant. It doesn't seem important. It doesn't seem to give them meaning. And for some people, it even seems as though the church may be harmful uh, because of maybe some experiences that they have had or maybe because of things that they've heard. And so we really need to take a look at these things. And these questions seem to be very easy to answer. They seem like basic questions. But have you ever really taken the time to just really sit and articulate the answers to these questions? You might find that it's actually a little bit more complicated to answer than you might think. So today we're going to look at the first one. Why do I need Jesus? Or why do we need Jesus? And again, that answer sounds so simple, but it really is multifaceted. We need Jesus for a lot of reasons. But if you were to sit down with somebody and actually answer that question, you might get tongue-tied. <laughs> you might think, well, where do I start? Where do I begin? And so I'm going to just offer you some suggestions, some, some ways in which we need Jesus in our lives. And then you can take some of those with you if you want. Maybe one will resonate with you more than another that you would be able to use if you happen to have a discussion, or even if you don't have just an outright discussion about it, uh, to be able to share with someone why Jesus is important to you. So the first thing I think of when I think of Jesus is I think about how Jesus saves us from sin. And so sin is an interesting word, and sin is a word that's more complicated than it seems to. We all have certain things we think of when we think of sin. It might be certain actions, certain things that are against the law or against God's law. However, we see God's law as being, and we see sin as being an action, something that we do. The word sin actually means to miss the mark. So uh, have any of you shot a bow and arrow before? Are any of you pretty good at it? All right. Yeah. Uh, I've not, I don't think I've ever done that. I've done the suction cup arrows when I was a kid, but I, I've not done the actual one, and I think that probably if I did, I would miss the mark, right? That's what sin means, is when you're trying to hit the target, but you miss the mark. That's what the word literally means. And so anytime we are shooting for a goal and we don't make it. So in the religious context, when we are trying to follow God's way, whatever that is, or however we see it in a particular situation, and we don't hit that goal. In other words, if we veer off, then we are in sin. And so we are prone to wander. We are prone to stray, to go down the wrong path. And that's why we need Jesus. Because Jesus saves us as we go down that wrong path. You know, I don't know how often I use GPS more than I would like to admit but any time I go to a city, every time I go to Omaha, <laughs> or any time I go to a place that's unfamiliar to me, I have the GPS. 
because roads are complicated and I am directionally challenged and so I need that to get me where I'm going in most cases. But I can only imagine flying an airplane. How many of you have flown an airplane? Yeah, some of you. When you fly an airplane, you don't have roads. And so I have, I've never done it, but I know that it's probably quite different than driving a car on a road where you have clear signs and markers of where to go, especially if you're flying at night you're going to need to know where to navigate and where to wh where you're going to eventually go. That's why airports have uh, those lights that flash at night so that people know where to land. We think about ships that go in the sea and they would use lighthouses to help them to see where they're going in the dark or if it's foggy. Uh, Jesus is kind of like that. Jesus is pointing the way, saying, here, this is the way you should go. And we are prone to stray. And when we do that, we live in disunity with God. That's what sin is. Sin is living in disunity with God. If we think about the story of the prodigal son, that can help us. Uh, with the prodigal son, uh, the son was always good with the father. He had a good relationship with the father. He wasn't born in disunity with his father. See, there are many different ways to think of sin. Uh, one way that some people think of sin is being kind of like a disease. Some kind of a, an inherited trait, an inherited disease that we are born with. According to this viewpoint, uh, we are guilty for the sins of Adam and Eve. We are guilty for the sins that came before us. Because Adam and Eve sinned, therefore, everybody inherits this sinful kind of like poisonous nature within us so that when we are born, we are born in sin from the very beginning. This is known as an idea called original sin, the idea that we are somehow affected or guilty because of the first or original sin of Adam and Eve. Uh, this was fully developed by Augustine in the church, during the church. I, off the top of my head, I don't remember when he was living, but it was... Uh, Hundreds of years after Jesus, this belief was fully developed. Uh, it's based on some, some metaphors that Paul used when he was talking about sin. Paul would use many metaphors to help people understand what sin is like. And he said some things that later on some church fathers developed into this idea of original sin. We are all born literally in sin. Some people will point out, you see how that baby, when that baby is an infant and how that baby is crying out for milk, that's selfish. Right? That's selfish and that's sin and that's why we're all born in sin because we sin from the very beginning. And that's why some people believe that baptism literally saves you from going to hell. Now, for the record, in the United Methodist Church, we don't believe that baptism saves you from hell because we don't believe that kid, infants have to be saved from hell, right? Because we don't really understand sin in that same way. And so, I believe that whereas that can sometimes be a helpful way to understand sin, it's, it's inaccurate. It, it wrecks havoc on our sense of justice and on our sense of God's justice, and it leads us to some pretty ridiculous conclusions. So, you know, an infant is not sinning when that child cries out for milk. An infant is completely helpless and the only way to survive is to cry out, right? And so uh, an infant is doing what God has made that infant to do in order to survive. And so that child is not sinning. You know, that we are not guilty for the sins of those who came before us. Uh, in the scripture it says that, that we should not be held accountable for the sins of people in generations past. We are held accountable for our own sins. And so we are not literally born in sin. It may seem that way, but we are not literally born in sin. We do not inherit some kind of a guilty status where we are born trash, basically. No, we are born in the image of God as children of God, but we do all sin, right? So we don't have to go into this complicated theory of how we somehow inherit a sinful nature and that we're all guilty to realize that we all sin. And so we have the same problem, right? We all sin. We all stray. We all go our own way. We all eventually end up living in disunity with God. 
And this is what happened in the story of the prodigal son. The son was in unity with his father from the beginning until he did what? Until he strayed. He took his father's inheritance. He left and he went on his own path away from his father. And he spent all of his money and made a mess of his life. And so it was really quite pathetic. But he's living in disunity with his father. His father doesn't even know if he's alive or dead. This is a story made up by Jesus, by the way, to teach us something about God, the Father. So this guy is living in disunity with his father. He comes to his senses and realizes, I can't make it on my own. I need my father, but I'm scared to death of him because I assume he's got to be really angry with me. And I assume there's going to be a massive punishment. I don't think I can even be considered his child, but maybe I can work with him as his slave. And so he goes back to his father, and you know what he finds out? He's had some misconceptions about his father. His father isn't angry with him. His father is ecstatic that he's alive and that he's returned and he's waiting with open arms. His father welcomes him back into unity with him. Well, oftentimes when we sin, when we stray, when we go our own way, maybe we didn't even know we were doing it at first, but then we're living in disunity with God. We can sometimes have some misconceptions of God, too. We can sometimes think that God must be angry with us and that God must be waiting to punish us massively. But the thing is, if we will just turn back to our Father, if we will repent of our sin, which literally means to change the direction and head back towards God, we'll find out that we've had some misconceptions about God. That God is not angry with you. That God just hopes that you will return, that you can be reconciled, that you can live in unity with God again. You'll find out that God is waiting with open arms. You know, there's nothing in the prodigal son story about the father saying, Boy, I hope he comes back or he's going to get me. He's just waiting. You see, Jesus saves us from sin by showing us that God is not angry with us. Jesus saves us by sin by, from sin by showing us that, that God is not the one who's moved away from us. That God is not the one who's separated himself with us because he can't stand under our sin. It's we who have separated ourselves from God because we've gone our own way, whether we've realized it or not. But Jesus declared in his life and in his death and in his resurrection that God loves you anyway and that God offers forgiveness. Jesus, whom we believe is the Son of God, gave his life on the cross. He would rather die than fight against us. He would rather forgive than to condemn. And so we realize, oh my goodness, God hasn't given us up on us. That means I can turn back to him. And so he saves us from sin. He saves us from wandering. So he saves us from sin. He also provides us as a guide. Jesus is our guide. Like that lighthouse that we were talking about, that we all look for that lighthouse to follow. Uh, when we follow Jesus as our guide, he, it helps keep us on that right path. As Christians, when we follow Jesus, that means we do what Jesus did. We love our enemies. We feed the hungry, we clothe the naked, we care for the sick, we welcome those who are outcast and oppressed, we, we join together in doing the things that Jesus did, and when we do, we keep our eyes on the lighthouse, we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we continue down that path. Following Jesus leads us to Jesus. Doing the things Jesus did, caring about the things Jesus cared about, leads us closer to him every time. So he is our guide in life. He saves us from sin. He also saves us from death. We're all afraid of death. Well, I shouldn't say we're all afraid of death, but most of us, at one time or another in our lives, are afraid of death. Death comes for everyone. We all wish to avoid it, but it does. We have reminders of that all the time. We looked in our newspaper last Thursday, and one page was filled with obituaries. You know, we know that. Death is a reality. So how does Jesus save us from death? Because it certainly seems like death is still here. Well, in our communion liturgy, this is called the mystery of faith. And so in our communion liturgy, I say, as we proclaim the mystery of faith, and we all say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. 
There's a reason it's called the mystery of faith, because what Jesus did on the cross and in the resurrection is not something that we can boil down to a nice, neat equation or a transaction that we can teach people. Well, this is how it works. You know, it's kind of like you can teach kids multiplication in school. That's easy. Well, I shouldn't say it's easy. I'm not a teacher. Never mind. But, but there is a way to teach multiplication, right? There is a problem and there is an answer. But when it comes to the cross, it's more of a mystery. It's more multifaceted. And there are many ways to think about how Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross. And so if anybody says, I've got it, I understand it completely, this is what happened, boom, boom, they probably don't understand how complicated it really is. But what we do know is that Jesus did not refuse to go through death himself. Instead, he died himself. And then not only did Jesus, who is God, go through death himself, the most ridiculous thing in all of religion is the belief that God died. <laughs> but we believe that God died, that God went through death, that Jesus died on the cross. And then on Easter morning, he rose up, proclaiming that death is not permanent, that death is not the end, proclaiming that death had no power over him, there's a tradition within the Christian church as well that during the time Jesus died, he descended to the dead or he went to the place of death and that he basically conquered it and said, death will have no power over us anymore. Life will always have the final word. And so in a mysterious way that we can't quite explain, we know that through Jesus' death and resurrection, death itself has been destroyed. And at the end of Revelation, we have this wonderful image of, of death being thrown into the lake of fire. Right? Anytime you're reading Revelation, you know you're dealing with a lot of metaphors. So it's really confusing. But death itself is destroyed, in other words. So that death is no more. So Jesus saves us from sin and death. He is our guide. And the last thing I want to mention is that Jesus invites us to participate in the renewal of all things. In Revelation, we have that image of a new heavens and a new earth. Again, a lot of metaphor here, but God is in the business of renewing and restoring his creation. And so we should be in the business of renewing and restoring creation as well. And that can mean a lot of things. But one thing it means is that when we participate in the Christian life, when we join Jesus, when we care for others, as I shared earlier, when we care for the sick, when we welcome the foreigner, when we, when we uh, visit those in prison, when we feed the hungry, when we serve others, we are taking part in God's renewal of the world, one person at a time. That's what it means to follow Jesus. So, he saves us from sin, he saves us from death, he is our lighthouse or our guide to staying on the right path instead of straying, and we can join him in the renewal of all things. That's a lot of stuff, and it takes time to unpack all of those things. And let me tell you, if somebody asks you why they need Jesus, don't tell them all of this at once. Don't give them a 20-minute sermon, because if you do, it will be the last question they ever ask you. <laughs> You know, instead, take maybe there's one thing that resonates with you more than others that you can share. Or maybe, too, if this conversation, and I don't know exactly how this conversation would come up, it probably wouldn't be, tell me why you, why you think I need Jesus. But if the conversation somehow comes up, maybe instead of telling them why they need Jesus, because that can be kind of condescending, right? If you don't, if you say it wrong, you can, you can be really condescending. Instead... Tell them why you need Jesus. Why is Jesus important to you? What has Jesus saved you from? Uh, what does it mean to say that Jesus has saved you from sin or death? Or, or what does it mean that Jesus is your God, your lighthouse, uh, to keep you on the right path? And maybe you can share a story or two from your life and say, well, this is why I need Jesus. And, you know, why you need Jesus might be a little bit different for you, but this is why I need Jesus. And I feel Jesus is important in my life. So I want to encourage you to know that you are equipped.
not just because of this sermon, but because of your life as a Christian, you've been seeking to follow Christ. And I know that none of us follow Christ perfectly. We do so to the best of our ability. But you are equipped to give an answer because you have a story, because you have your own story. And if you can know and think about why you need Jesus, then you'll be ready to share with others what Jesus means to you.